one hour, oh, moderating the one hour session. We're also streaming the Rome students and Professor Guerrero wants us to mention that the PDFs will be um, uploaded and sent to them today. So hopefully they can hear us. Um, so we only have an hour. So what we would like to do is that uh, you will see the flyers for the individual elective courses projected uh, one at a time when the faculty sees the poster, if they can just come to the front and we um, ask that you just give a two minute literally two-minute presentation. We have about 24 courses that need to be presented, and we need to do that within one hour. Uh, we're going to begin with the intercession courses. There's three, I believe, uh, courses being offered in the intercession, and then we will move to the regular spring offerings. I would ask that you um, hold any questions to the very end, and you can either come and speak directly to the faculty who are offering the courses, or you can email them uh, independently if you have uh, more specific questions. Okay, so with that, we will turn it over to um, the, the first. Teofilo? Good afternoon. Um, this, is, this is a, um, a study abroad School of Architecture course. Um, on site, it studies the, um, the uh, buildings and urbanism of the Renaissance architect Andrea Palladio in uh, Venice and the Veneto. It travels uh, from Venice to Padova, Vicenza, Mantova, and returns to Venice. It's, uh, it coincides precisely with the uh, spring break um, um, time frame, and uh, it's taught by uh, uh, Adib Cure and myself. And uh, it engages the uh, work of Andrea Palladio uh, uh, firsthand, of course. It uh, visits complete works, as well as incomplete works, uh, works under restoration, um, works uh, that are being, works that are today being used for either the same purpose as they were initially uh, conceived for, or, or different ones. I point this out because uh, in Venice, or rather in northern Italy, I'm not quite sure this is the case throughout, but in northern Italy, mm, buildings and properties are held uh, by the same family that commissions the building originally for a very long time. So for instance, uh, to give you an example, the uh, Pisani Placo, which is 500 years old, more or less, has had two owners in his 500 year history, or um, and so on. The students are, are it's a drawing course, it's an a, a analytical drawing course in sketch form. The students keep a journal and uh, they do a series of drawings. Actually, we work with, uh, with uh, uh, Alberti's lineaments where the essential elements of architecture are explained. And these are the, uh, the drawings, the criteria rather for the drawings. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. This course entitled Construction Documents is designed to help students typically towards the end of their undergraduate or graduate architectural educations develop skills in architectural detailing, building, and zoning code comprehension, as well as drawing composition. These skills are particularly important as students transition from an academic setting to a more professional one as they begin their careers in architectural offices. Students will begin the semester working on a few pre preliminary exercises focused on zoning and building code to develop one's understanding. Upon completion of this, and this is really the sort of core project in the class, 
uh, students will select a, a sort of masterpiece building, either built and perhaps not incredibly well documented, or an unbuilt masterpiece. Uh, eventually, you know, researching building techniques, building systems, uh, to eventually produce a set of construction documents. The work can be done in teams or individually, and I'm looking for students who are, are motivated, who have a keen interest in researching and investigating great works of architecture. You should think of this as an opportunity to understand how great buildings are assembled and the graphic conventions architects use to deliver intent to the builders. Uh, remember that architecture is an art that is manifest in, in physical form without necessarily doing physical work. So the, the, the drawing is really how the sort of, and the comprehension of the drawing and the clarity of the drawing is really how the message uh, of intent is delivered to a builder. So this course is really designed around developing uh, those skills. Architecture 517 is an elective that also satisfies one of the professional uh, elective series course requirements as well. And are there three of them or something like that? Three or four? Two on this subject. Okay. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Architecture 574674 is a transnational, transcultural uh, survey of the early modern world, its architecture, uh, cities, and landscapes from approximately 1400 to 1750, what we call uh, more conventionally the Renaissance and Baroque. The course will look at the idea of the Renaissance, the idea of a renewal of ancient uh, knowledge or culture, and uh, look at uh, a number of themes associated with the city as a house, uh, the relationship between architecture and nature, uh, beginning in Italy and then moving throughout Europe, through France, England, Spain, Germany, we will look at the development of the modern city, public space, uh, before we extend that discussion to the New World and the uh, colonization of the Americas, both Latin America and North America. The course uh, requires a considerable amount of reading and writing and looks for a small group of students that will engage in intense discussion of architectural treatises, books, and uh, as my mentor, the architectural historian, uh, Joseph Rickwert used to say, history is all we know, so you better know it well. Good afternoon. Uh, so I'll be uh, teaching an elective in uh, Introduction to Programming for Architects, course ARC 583683. Uh, so as digital tools continue to play uh, an increasing role in the architect's toolkit, it is becoming increase increasingly important that architects not only understand how to use and navigate these tools, uh, but to customize and adapt them to their specific needs. Um, so learning how to program, 
uh, allows architects to start to fully utilize the potential in digital tools by maximizing the possibilities in not only 3D modeling and digital fabrication, uh, but in responsive architecture, embedded computation, and animating spaces contributing to a more dynamic uh, pot and potentially interconnected built environment. Uh, so this course will be split into two parts. Uh, the first part will be looking in uh, the fundamental programming concepts, so uh, data types, control flow statements, functions and classes using processing, uh, which is an open source pro programming language built with the purpose of teaching the fundamentals of computer programming in a visual context. Um, we'll then move on to uh, the second part, which focuses on parametric design. Uh, and so this course will be working with particularly Grasshopper for Rhino, um, which is a popular visual programming IDE for parametric design, looking at its nuances and its various plugins while also applying programming concepts to create custom components within the application. Um, everything will be done individually, uh, so we'll have uh, mini exercises every week um, with two major uh, assignments, both in mid-review uh, mid and then uh, final. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Liz plater Zyberg, and I will be teaching an elective course um, on the topic of adaptation to climate change. Um, we will be uh, covering both aspects, um, mitigating climate change, which is a universal action that everyone around the world can, um, can undertake to try to reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions, and but the large part of the semester will be spent on adaptation scenarios and an expl exploration of what that means um, because it is a regional action, highly localized, depending on local conditions. So while we in South Florida suffer from um, the prospect of sea level rise um, and in fact are feeling its effects already, if you were from Nebraska, you would be worried about the drinking water supply, which comes from a depleting, depleting underground aquifer. Um, this, I've taught this course twice. Uh, every time it's different, um, not only because the conditions are changing, but the uh, composition of the class warranted that. So uh, one year we looked at uh, global adaptation and students studied what was going on in their home town or home country. And um, last year we did a booklet for Dade County in which every commissioner's district was studied um, and a document was given to the local government. So I would be glad to hear from those of you who want to sign into this course, um, whether you would rather be uh, all looking at one topic together where we could have some sort of impact um, in a civic engagement or whether you would like to study this topic related to uh, where you're coming from or where you think you will be going. So um, that's still up in the air and I hope to respond to the students. familiar to all of you um, uh, as I teach the uh, second year uh, history course. Uh, I've also taught in second year studio and uh, in the past in upper level studios. Uh, I want to talk uh, just a, a little bit about a course that I'm offering next semester, uh, which is a critical history of contemporary architecture uh, from uh, decon and high tech to uh, Classic, classicism and neo-vernacular. Uh, it's a course which I've taught for a few years now, and we meet in the library, uh, which is a very nice place for us to meet because the point of the course is to be a seminar, a discussion. Um, we, in each, in each session, look at one traditional or classical architect 
and one uh, deacon or high-tech architect. Uh, so we are essentially tracing uh, the history perhaps of the last 25 years. Uh, we begin with postmodernism and uh, bring it right up to the present. And the point of it is to be a revisionist history. Uh, the architectural press seems to think that there is only one avant-garde, uh, but I believe very strongly uh, that there are at least two movements that have a strong claim on the avant-garde. The movements that are derived from 20th century modernism on the one hand, but on the other we have much more deep-rooted movements, uh, the classical and the neo-vernacular. So the idea is to give you a much more rounded and fuller understanding of the architecture of today. Every student will choose an architect, uh, a recent architect, and work on that topic through the semester to give a pre presentation towards the end of the term and, uh, and to write a research paper on that architect. Uh, so it does also change a little bit from semester to semester, uh, but the point uh, really is to get you uh, interested and excited uh, about the possibilities of contemporary architecture. Uh, I'd also like to mention that I have a spring break course which is tracing the development of London from 1600 uh, to the present day, and if anyone is interested in that, uh, please get in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Professor Camps. Uh, for those who know me, uh, know that I specialize in the topic of uh, building information modeling. Uh, we're going to start a new course here at the University of Miami, which is a theoretical discussion of BIM. We find it that a lot of students uh, get experience with the technology, but they don't always know why they're there, and they don't know where they're going with this technology. So this course is going to introduce students to what is building information modeling, what does the I stand for, BIM, what is not building information modeling. We're going to look at larger issues with uh, integrated practice. We're going to see how uh, documentation and professional practice uh, intersects with BIM. We're also going to understand what the value proposition of BIM is. We're going to explore BIM use cases. Uh, a lot of folks don't understand that you could design, engineer, fabricate, manufacture, and manage data for the life cycle, so we're going to uh, explore that. Uh, long term, we're going to find out who pays for BIM, who does BIM, and who benefits. We're going to look at, um, what else are we going to look at? We're going to look at BIM in the international front. BIM is not something that's just happening here in the United States, but we're going to look at how uh, it goes across the globe and how BIM uh, intersects with the globalization of the building construction industry. We're also going to look at standards like uh, IFC and find out what IFC is. We're also going to look at something called COBE, which stands for Construction Building operations uh, information exchange, and what are those things that you're expected to deliver in the real professional practice. So long, uh, long story short, we're going to really do a deep dive on the four corners of BIM, and we're going to have a practical. Thank you very much. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Victor Santana, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a construction management course that we developed for the Master's in Real Estate Development Program. However, it is open to architecture students as well. And the point of the course is to analyze construction management from the perspective of the owner, from the developer side, and not necessarily from the contractor side, which is your traditional construction management course. And so we're going to be discussing what is the development cycle, what is the project life cycle of projects. From the moment that you acquire a site, so you do your due diligence, to so you do your target marketing, building programming, uh, eventual construction uh, to lease up, uh, and um, management to your eventual divestment of the project. 
your exit strategy, upon which all the returns are based on. And speaking of returns, the financing of these projects is also discussed in terms of the cash flow, because that's how projects are analyzed in terms of their viability or not, and whether a bank or a financing institution or an investor is gonna finance this project for you. Uh, so we're gonna take a look at all those aspects of uh, development, as well as uh, the, the contractual and legal structure of the, uh, the entities involved, the contractor, the owner, and the architect. The relationship they all have, the obligations and responsibilities that, are, that, that, that go with each uh, entity, as well as <coughs> the, um, the construction documents, which not only include the drawings and specifications, but also the, the, the AIA contracts that, that go along with that along as what the responsibilities that architects have during the pay application process and the owners have in terms of reviewing releases of liens, et cetera. Uh, the term project is a schedule that we create uh, that takes a look at the timeline, the development timeline of a project uh, from acquisition to divestment. Uh, and uh, again, the focus of the course is the uh, managing the process of development and the development team members and not necessarily construction. Uh, have a good afternoon, thank you. I actually prepared a whole slide presentation. I thought we were gonna have more time. Can we put on the slide presentation? We'll just flip through them. Uh, my name is Professor Rocco Cheo. Excuse my uh, attire. I have design built today. And hello to those in Rome. Uh, my course is Color and Architecture. It's the course that really I believe is in some ways essential to uh, a very important part of architecture, was being able to control uh, the use and application of color in architecture. Take a look at this image, focus for about 10 seconds on the red dot on the right. And when it starts to vibrate a little, shift your gaze to the circle on the left, the white circle. What do you see? If you see a bluish green color, you're experiencing what's called simultaneous contrast in your eyes. The red uh, is stimulating the co cones and rods in your eyes and creating the complementary color to that, which is blue-green. It was thought to be red and green for many years until the early 1800s. But it underscores one of the principles of color, which is that it's constantly deceptive. When you look at something and shift your gaze, uh, your eye, the, the, co the effect that you get in your eye, which is really what allows you to see color um, is constantly changing. And so this course is about learning about color, its application. Uh, it's going to run for 16 weeks. We will have lectures every week with readings, uh, in-class color exercises. And with that will be um, a project at the end of the semester which will involve creating your own color palette and applying it to a small design project, a pump house for Fairchild Tropical Garden. So these are images that just talk about the structure of the course. Uh, this is an image by Botticelli, Chevro. These are what the in-class exercises look like. This is uh, making one color look like two different colors using Albert's technique. You'll do a color analysis of an existing site. And then finally, you'll uh, produce your own color palette and apply it to a project that you design, such as this image. Thank you. Thank you. Was there only one slide? Okay, um, can you hear me? Uh, my name is uh, Professor Jose Hellebert Navia. Uh, some of you uh, might have had me in design or in history. I teach two history courses. One semester is a world architecture class, which we're teaching now, and the other semester is a contemporary Latin American course. The purpose, actually, of both courses is the same, and that is the fact that most history of architecture is taught from a Western point of view, um, 
mainly European. Uh, and um, I always felt that the component in terms of the rest of the world uh, was missing uh, from our curriculum. This is even more important, I think, right now when the majority of our students are from the rest of the world, uh, many from Latin America and uh, many from other parts. So a lot of what the course is intended to do is to introduce uh, you all to a lot of extraordinary things that are taking place right now. The course moves very quickly, um, and basically we cover uh, almost all of Latin America. Um, it is structured around primarily countries. Uh, sometimes in some countries we focus on early modernist uh, architecture, uh, such as uh, Chile, uh, although we do show some contemporary, uh, very recent work like uh, Aravena's uh, project there. Uh, but we also talk about a number of social and cultural issues, uh, such as what is going on in Venezuela right now from an architectural and a cultural point of view. Uh, we talk about the heroic uh, modernist uh, movement in Latin America that actually found more of a um, calling here in Latin America uh, than it did uh, in other parts of the world. My wife would love that beeper every time I talk if she could cut me off after two minutes. <laughs> So um, the elective course that I'll be teaching, I'm Deborah Frankie. It's an evidence-based design and research seminar. The course also serves uh, to prepare you for the evidence-based design accreditation and certification, which is a great certification to have as you guys uh, move into the professional world. Um, so we're going to learn what is evidence-based design, what is it used for, what kind of research strategies can we use to kind of collect evidence. Really, how do we connect um, the outcomes uh, uh, to our facility design using a framework and how we translate some of that evidence that we collect to inform our design. So evidence-based design is really the process of basing our, des our design decisions about the built environment and credible research to achieve the best possible outcome. So in a sense, it's a different way of thinking that our design decisions truly have an impact on outcomes and how people perceive the built environment. So while this was traditionally associated to healthcare architecture, this is actually expanding to other architectural areas. So throughout this course, you will learn the tools to collect, analyze, interpret, and translate evidence. Um, this is kind of the evidence-based design model. The beginning of the model really looks at collecting existing evidence, and the other part is about generating new architectural knowledge. So through the course, you will be doing a small research project. We try to tie this course to your design studio, so you will select an aspect of your design studio that you would like to learn more about. You will do a literature review, case study research, and then eventually you will collect uh, some data on a similar facility of what you're designing. So I'll teach survey research. Survey is really about perceptions of the built environment, qualitative research to understand the why and the how of our human behavior and experience, and evaluation research, particularly post-occupancy evaluation, which is when we go to a facility after it's been built and we actually uh, measure to see what the outcomes. So again, we define our problem. We have to think about what are the desired outcomes. We have a design intervention and that's actually what leads to our results. We can get some of our critical information or the existing knowledge through a literature review. I integrate GILDA at the beginning of the course uh, 
to really help you uh, learn how to navigate our library system, which is great. Um, we're going to do a lot of case study analysis, but in a more systematic way than we're used to doing case study analysis. And we will learn how to do surveys so we can really understand kind of perceptions, standard deviation, mean scores. Um, and finally, you're going to come up with a design intervention that actually for your studio project that actually was informed by some sort of evidence. Thank you. Hi guys. Um, all right. So furniture is essentially a uh, architectural problem, and we approach it that way and kind of find resolutions in both the design, the structural um, perspective. In this class, you're going to take a concept from uh, through the entire process, and that the design process, and that includes sketching, modeling, mock-ups, and uh, ultimately working drawings. What makes this class different is that from those working drawings, we actually create what it is you've designed. And that comes in the form of a fully resolved piece of furniture. So we get deeply involved in machine skills, hand skills, CNC work, um, all things sort of pertaining to that wood shop, which you probably have all been in, and really sort of elevating the application of all these machines and all these tools um, and ultimately come up with a really nice piece of furniture, fully resolved, built to a very high level, high standard. And um, if you have any interest in gauging sort of what the class is all about, we're currently, in fact, I think as we speak, there's students working on projects in our studio. So I'd encourage you to come by and see what it is uh, students are making, because they're about halfway into these and they're starting to take shape. So there's some interest in that. Um, and lastly, I would just say, um, as architects, you're all creative by nature. And I would argue that making something by hand is probably the most sort of essential and fulfilling aspect of the creative process. So I encourage you to come experience that. Thanks. Good afternoon, my name is Vanessa Grossman and I'm here to present a seminar on post-war affordable housing in the West. So housing has been a major site for experiments throughout the history of modern architecture where social values, political and economical pro projects and new forms of collectivity and sociability were tested and shaped. Housing blossomed after World War II, related to issues of reconstruction for destroyed countries, but also of urbanization and population boom. The problem of affordable housing then became a reality which was mostly tied to the long history of welfare in Europe, but also to a few political episodes in the Americas. With more recent developments, such as the 2008 housing crash in the United States, the problem of affordable housing is now re-emerging, but has not yet been fully taken hold in professional architectural circles. This seminar will explore key topics and examples of 20th and a few 21st century affordable housing projects. We will also examine the various scales of housing projects from the individual body to walls and openings from the apartment block, sorry, from the apartment unit to the block, skyscraper and larger housing complexes. We will also look at production systems, social facilities, environmental factors, economic and social political challenges. So the seminar is structured in different case studies that evolve chronologically and are organized around themes such as colonialism, the relation between modernity and tradition, issues of monumentality, typology and agency. The students will be invited to give presentations, to promote and participate actively in the discussions, and the final exam will be a paper on one of the topics raised in class. So for advanced stu students, this will be a major opportunity to develop theoretical and historical research, as well as critical writing. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Rick Lopez. Um, I'll be teaching in the spring ARC 518, which is a historic uh, documentation program course. Um, this semester, we're going to be um, traveling to Santiago de Cuba to uh, document one of the 12 churches that has been put on the World Monument Watch, which is uh, a step towards the uh, UNESCO World Heritage uh, Site. Um, the churches, some of them are in the city, some are just in the countryside. I'm not quite sure which one it will be yet, uh, but the course is intended to be in conjunction with uh, George Hernandez's preservation studio. So some of you may consider taking the studio and the documentation course together. Um, for those of you not familiar with HABS, the Historic American Building Survey was initiated in the 1930s during um, the Great Depression. Uh, the National Park Service put a great number of architects to work uh, by beginning an archive of uh, our historic buildings, which were uh, being demolished in, uh, in light of new, de uh, new developments in the 1920s. Um, that archive has grown immensely since then. Um, the, the, the standards and guidelines of documentation are still the same. You know, we use you know, measuring tapes and pencils, but we have also now adopted new techniques, um, including uh, photogrammetry. We work with uh, the Center for Computational Sciences, uh, who will be joining us with their drones and cameras. Some of you can work with them. Uh, after they process the data, we'll have point clouds that will help us uh, complete the set of drawings uh, to the standards um, for the uh, submission to the Library of Congress. Although this is not an American building, we'll be following the same standards. And there is a new uh, collection in the Caribbean um, also working closely with Washington to develop standards that we might be submitting them to as well. Um, if anybody has questions, please reach out to me anytime. Thanks. seven-day course in London over spring break. Uh, it's based actually on uh, a model that I've developed over a, about a decade, uh, primarily in Paris. Um, uh, it's an extremely intense course uh, because it's entirely taught on site. And we will be tracing uh, the development and architecture of London uh, from the time of Shakespeare, from about 1600 uh, to the present day. So looking, for instance, uh, at the introduction, really, of the Italian Renaissance through the work of Inigo Jones for the Stuart Court, uh, right the way up uh, to uh, the extraordinary, uh, vibrant and eclectic architectural scene at the end of the 20th century. And then, uh, with the lottery that was launched uh, in preparation for the millennium and the Olympics in 2012, uh, the explosion uh, of architecture uh, in, in London. It really is a world city in terms of uh, architecture, and uh, we will be uh, looking at a number of very recent and significant buildings uh, by uh, firms such as uh, Zaha Hadid and uh, David Chipperfield, Norman Foster, Richard Rogers, uh, etc. Uh, one of the very nice things about the course uh, is that uh, I leave it up to students uh, to uh, sort out their flights and accommodation so there isn't a travel package. Uh, I've tried to do this in the past uh, because students always say, well, we have friends in London or family or I want to use Airbnb or something like that. Uh, so that is fine. The other very nice thing about it, uh, much to my uh, regret is that the pound sterling has completely collapsed. Um, uh, and uh, so it's in fact uh, probably the most economical time for the last few decades uh, to, to visit London. Uh, if you have a question, just ask.
So the discovery of what is called epistemological empiricism in the 17th century, which is the role of experience in the acquisition of knowledge, gave birth to what we call nowadays, I mean, what uh, in the 18th century became a very important tradition, which was the traveling tradition in architectural schools that generated the price of Rome and expeditions to Greece and the Mediterranean colonies. We are building upon that tradition and um, we'll be visiting with Professor Behar, uh, Amsterdam, Rotterdam, and Bruges. Uh, three cities that have, I mean, somehow, conditions that are similar to the conditions that we're going to be faced with uh, during um, sea level rise in the next 50 to 75 years. In there, we, this is not the first time that we do this course. Uh, we've been uh, doing it for a while, and therefore we have very good uh, um, uh, relationships with the School of Delft, uh, particularly something that is called the Y Factory. Uh, we will be visiting the offices of MVRDV, OMA, and Mecanu, uh, and studying very closely uh, the architecture of the early 20th century, uh, particularly the School of Amsterdam. Um, the course is really a course uh, that, that is focused on the relationship between architecture, urbanism, and the art of building cities. I don't think that in, a global, in the global circumstances that we're living today, it, uh, students should only be taking courses of architecture in Miami. I mean, they should be spreading the, the, their wings, I mean, seeing how everything works all over the world, and bringing back, I mean, those experiences with you to intervene in our American cities. Thank you. So I'm Jaime Correa. <laughs> no, just kidding. Just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> um, the other course was in the winter intercession. Uh, this course is in the spring semester, in the spring break, uh, with Carmen Guerrero. Uh, we're doing Austria and Czechoslovakia, uh, uh, basically Vienna and Prague. Uh, as you know, Vienna uh, was one of the most important places, I mean, uh, of, for philosophy and the development of art in the 1920s. Wittgenstein, Ludwig von Mises, Karl Popper, Sigmund Freud, all of these people come from there, and they had somehow a tremendous influence on the architecture of those two cities. Particularly with, uh, I mean, I'm gonna stretch it just a little bit here, the creation of what is called the secession, and the steel, or the steel, uh, two uh, very ornate uh, movements uh, that populated the city of Austria, uh, I mean, in a very important manner, and also a creation of uh, the super interesting uh, public planning projects, particularly the, the one that we will be most interested in uh, visiting, which is those projects that have to do with what was called Red Vienna. Uh, Red Vienna wa was basically rediscovered by Aldo Rossi in the 1950s, late 1950s and 1960s when he was writing for Casabella Continuita. And they're projects that are very, very relevant to what we will be doing also in the next 75 to 100 years right here in um, uh, Miami. Uh, we will also be visiting uh, uh, Praga, uh, or Prague. Uh, uh, Prague, as you know, is so beautiful that Adolf Hitler did not um, allow to throw any bombs in, uh, in the city just because it was so, so wonderful. Uh, so thank you. I hope you can join us for these two courses. Good afternoon, I'm Alan Schulman. 
Um, this is not an intercession course. Um, <laughs> this is tropical architecture. Uh, perhaps a theme that um, you've had some exposure to just by being here in Miami and by doing projects here at the school. Um, but this is a chance to look at tropical architecture more in depth and in its many facets. So on one hand, it has something to do with looking at the functional aspects of tropical architecture like shelter and ventilation. But on, another hand, uh, on the other hand, it's about going deeper and looking at how tropical architecture has evolved in, in response to cultural uh, factors, political factors, building typology, uh, lifestyle, um, a much broader set of, um, of issues. So um, we're going to look at tropical architecture through the filter of vernacular, through the filter of colonialism, through the filter of modern architecture and of critical regionalism, and, uh, and the interrelationship of all of those and interdependency of all of those factors. Um, traditionally, uh, because, the, because the subject and the research um, are trying to pull out some new themes in tropical architecture, we've always done some element of new documentation, new research, um, and traditionally we've built models, uh, and those models have been exhibited in four uh, exhibitions um, in Florida. Uh, currently nine or ten models are on exhibit at History Miami uh, for the exhibition The Discipline of Nature, Alfred Browning Park in Florida. This semester, however, we're not going to be doing models. Uh, we're going to be doing analytical drawings. So. Um, that's going to be the sort of um, interesting new information that we're producing. So anyway, I hope um, uh, you find the material interesting and look forward to seeing you in the class. Also, um, I wanted to, because Esber Andiraglu is not here, or is he here? Is Esber here? Uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about his, his course, which is Sustainability in Context. So this is sustainability in context uh, and uh, or, or energy in buildings. Um, and I'm just going to read this. A comprehensive investigation of ecological and environmental factors coupled with building construction materials, mechanical systems, and electrical systems when developing sustainable architecture. This course provides students with general understanding of main factors contributing to energy consumption in buildings and overall impact on lifestyle analysis. Uh, of buildings. Concepts discussed are demonstrated in multiple interactive case studies, a quantitative understanding of energy fundamentals, examples from practice, and design exercises using computer simulation programs are emphasized. So the learning objectives, learning objectives of the class are, it is expected that students will understand the primary concepts and components contributing to energy use in buildings and communities. In addition, students will develop knowledge of advanced terminology related to building components, energy and atmosphere, thermal comfort, and building costs and life cycles. So if you have questions about that class, I really um, ask you to contact Professor Andiraglu uh, directly. And thank you very much. Good afternoon, my name is Adib Kure. Uh, since the year 2000, I've been part of a, I've been teaching a class, a course, a studio, titled the Open City Studio. This is a studio that I've been teaching with other members of the faculty. And along the way, over, since the year 2000, we've traveled to different places in the world to study cities, architecture and urbanism from different cities, including places like Mumbai and Cape Town. 
uh, as well as Tokyo. It's a city that we've traveled to many times, and we've made a great discovery in Tokyo as, along the way, uh, as every, ever since the year 2002, and that was the discovery of a group of architects and, art, and artists, uh, including Teronobu Fujimori and Genpei Akasegawa. These were interesting, uh, they were doing, producing interesting work uh, right after the, the war, but particularly in 1986 when they founded uh, something called the Street Observation Society in Japan. Uh, and the members of the society came together, in, in essence, to search for moments of beauty found in ordinary, everyday places. Uh, the, the activities of the group were primarily a fusion of two complementary approaches to looking at the city, which includes historical fieldwork and the analysis of overlooked buildings throughout urban Japan, particularly Tokyo, uh, as well as this kind of artistic sensibility of identifying as well as categorizing ready-made objects lying latent in the streets uh, of Tokyo. And so this, this work, the, the work produced by, this, by these architects and artists, inspired uh, and inspired by their efforts, um, is what really inspires this, 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 uh, this, this class titled, uh, called Made in Miami, which will observe, analyze, and record the material culture as well as the vernacular traditions in Miami, searching for the unique characteristics that arise from an understanding of the poetics of the prosaic. We will, this, the course will be structured uh, with informal lectures uh, followed by a series of walks throughout the city, and plenty of walks throughout the city, um, uh, key neighborhoods of Miami. And the students will be asked uh, to, function, to function as urban detectives, uh, recording their discoveries by way of photography, but most importantly by way of drawings, to uncover an, alter, an alternate reading of the city of Miami not readily advertised or promoted. In contemporary, in contemporary depictions of the place. Thank you very much. Hi, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Professor Kathy Wheeler. Um, my elective course next semester is ARC 476676. This is a course that is actually required for architectural engineering students. So one of the things that I love about teaching this course is that it has a mix of students from all different places. We've also had students from journalism um, and from other departments outside of architecture, but you'll definitely find engineers in there. So the course is tweaked a little bit to be looking at the 19th and 20th century as a development of architectural technology. We begin the two examples up there um, I like in part because you're showing the development of new materials and with the development of new materials, new tectonics and construction systems, we'll be looking at some of that. So we go through the materials, iron, steel, glass, concrete, look at how they were used in the past and how they're used now. Um, we also look at the development of infrastructure, so what is the implication of a city in terms of developing sewers and what is the implication in your house of having to put in plumbing in terms of design. We also look at um, HVAC systems and air conditioning, what does that do to the design of architecture? Also the development of vertical transportation systems, elevators, stairs, um, escalators, that was the other one. And one of my favorites is actually the development of lighting. So going from candlelight, what do you do if you're designing, like if you're, if you're watching a movie um, that's depicting the 18th century and you can sort of see the lighting is somehow odd, what does that mean to have that type of lighting um, versus now with the development of fluorescence and LEDs and all of that? How do we change our design to fit the technology? So there's a, a little bit of a tweak to it. Um, the requirements are a case study, which is done individually as a student, so all the students will each do one case study. Um, so usually the classes, I give a lecture, and then the students will do a case study. That's a building that's related to that topic for that day. Um, and then you also do a final research paper and presentation on the topic of your choice. Um, people have done specific architects, uh, specific uh, systems and technologies. Kind of it's up to you in that regard. The most fun is the conversation, though. Thank you. Good afternoon, once again. Um, this is a course uh, dedicated to the work of Andrea Palladio, the uh, 16th century Venetian architect. 
one of the virtues of studying Palladio is that his work over the years uh, constitutes as comprehensive a body of work as one could wish for. There are, of course, buildings, uh, 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 I mean, texts, treatises, as well as an uh, extraordinary body of uh, drawings, both technical drawings, project drawings, as well as uh, documentation. So it offers, an it offers an opportunity, the study of Andrea Palladio, to uh, become familiar with the work uh, of the architect in his uh, totality, this notion of the notion, the Vitruvian notion of theory and practice, uh, we think is uh, embodied in the body of work that uh, represents uh, the Renaissance in northern Italy by this architect. The way that the course is structured, it meets uh, twice a week on Mondays and Wednesdays. The uh, Monday is a seminar, and as the term suggests, is a lecture and a discussion on the lecture. And Wednesdays is used uh, for, the, for the workshop, for the projects that uh, students individually will engage on the work of Andrea Palladio. Because the work of Andrea Palladio is so ample, so broad, and so of such a great scope, it can be viewed uh, from different points of view, different perspectives. This year we're dedicating, uh, we're focusing rather, on the influence of the work of these uh, uh, Renaissance architects on the evolution and development of modern architecture. Uh, categorization, typology, and so on. Thank you very much. So that concludes the presentations, unless there's someone in the room that we may have missed. I don't think so. Um, there's a class in. in